Good morning chums, fellow time travellers, it's great to have you with me as we journey through space and time, all in one great big happy family. Uh, the first stop we made together was a million years ago in the village of Haysborough in Norfolk, uh, and since then, well we've been everywhere, up and down the long island of Britain and Ireland, north, south, east and west, always travelling through history, always coming towards the present day. This week it's 1888, all the 8s, and we're in Wales as it feeds the world's insatiable hunger for power. This is a podcast about history, a love of history, curiosity about history, and the curiosity, I think, rests in no small part upon the fact that the same things keep happening. It's like that thing about there's, apparently there's only seven plots for a movie and they just get recycled endlessly. There's only seven plots for a novel. It's all happened before, and you just have to get the knack of recognising it, looking for the telltale signs, and that's really the game we play on this podcast. Uh, It's about contemplating history. It's about thinking about history, loving history, uh, and wondering if it's the answer that provides the clarity to help us cope with the present day and prepare for the future. So if you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com and join up, part with a little bit of cash, monthly or annually. Uh, I've got a competition up and running at the moment on the Patreon site. Uh, There's limited edition t-shirts as prizes. Yes, you heard that correctly, limited edition t-shirts. I will be modelling one eventually, Uh, but it ends on the 18th of August, so you'll have to be quick if you want to get in on the action. All right, that's enough of the self-promotion. It's time to strap ourselves into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop. My love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. In 1904, the world's first ever million pound deal was struck. The first million pound cheque was signed. In this episode, we're following a family line that's rich, powerful and fabulously fecund. Politically astute, they sat on the Scottish and then ultimately on the English thrones. Spreading their influence right across this British archipelago. In the 19th century, from his castle in Cardiff, one clan member spotted a gilt-edged opportunity as coal became the black gold of its day. Everyone wanted and needed access to this precious resource. So, as the coal bonanza boomed around the world, he developed Cardiff docks. And as the coal shipped out, incredible fortunes poured in. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last episode we strolled along a beautiful Victorian promenade and signed into the glamorous Grand Hotel in Scarborough. Where are we this week? I'm afraid to say the holidays are over Paul and it's back to work now. Tough hard graft as it happens. When the Industrial Revolution swept around the world, iron and steel and coal were in great demand. And high grade coal from the Rhondda Valley became a very valuable commodity. If you could control the supply of this precious resource, there were fortunes to be made. The port of Cardiff became the busiest in Britain, and this week we're at its heart, the place where all the financial deals to feed this global hunger for coal were struck. We're at the Cardiff Coal Exchange. It's gone over the hill into history, the very idea really of a coal exchange in this country. It's a place, a building where the the price of coal as a traded commodity is set every day, like the price of oil or gas during the time of the Industrial Revolution. And right up into the early part of the 20th century, it was all about coal. So the coal exchange, one of the most important coal exchanges anywhere, was the coal exchange in Cardiff. 
I love Wales, I should say, and I will say that before I was involved in television, which is to say not until my 30s, I had almost nothing to do with Wales. It wasn't anywhere that we had a family connection to, it was nowhere we'd ever been on holiday, it was a bit of a mystery to me, but then once I got into the world of making television documentaries, I, oh, goodness, I don't know how many times I've been in Wales since. And for such a relatively small place, it's fantastically varied between south and north, you know, the landscapes, you know, between, the, say, Pembrokeshire and, and the Gower Peninsula down in the south, and then the difference between that in the south and the landscape in the north, Llandidno, we've featured Wales many times already in the love letter, Cardigan Bay, the wonderful coastal locations on the west, and it's so thick with myth and legend, tales of dragons and all the rest of it. It's come to mean a great deal to me. But the coal exchange is nicely odd. It's an unexpected story really anywhere because it's not about Arthurian legend or, or any of that kind of stuff. It's a standalone story. And believe it or believe it not, central to what happened there, why the coal exchange happened, why it's in Cardiff, is down to the Stuart family of Scotland. The Stuarts who, who ended up producing so many kings and queens in Scotland, and then on the death of Queen Elizabeth I of England, without an heir, it was the Stuart, James VI of Scotland, who became James I of England. So the Stuarts were a lineage that eventually took the big prize. And to some extent, you could say it very much was down to how fertile they were. They were a fantastically fecund lot, the Stuarts. And it, it's something that you might overlook, I suppose. But the fact is, however politically clever a king or queen is, whatever machinations and Machiavellian intrigue they can take control of, it's all for nothing if you can't produce an heir. Queen Elizabeth I, good Queen Bess, was pr probably the most significant monarch England ever had. But it began and ended with her, because she didn't deliver the goods. And ultimately, for all her success, all her troubles with Mary, Queen of Scots, Mary, Queen of Scots, was a Stuart. And Mary, Queen of Scots, ultimately had the last laugh because James the Sixth of Scotland, who became the first of England, was her son. So beheaded though she undoubtedly was, Mary Queen of Scots, by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. The Stuarts won the big prize. You know, like Henry VIII, Henry VIII, who was Elizabeth's father, he had some other problems. He was a fantastically successful king, ruthless, a great athletic figure of a man in his youth, very determined, very cunning, a, a very effective king. But he struggled and struggled and struggled to produce heirs, male heirs. They needed sons, and he, he couldn't do it. His one son, Edward, died on the throne right enough, but in his teens. He was incapable of producing enough, but the Stuarts were something else. Apart from producing all sorts of legitimate heirs with their wives, there were no end of illegitimates, bastards, who were also in the wings when the time was needed. The Stuart kings produced so many heirs and so many spares. <laughs> they were knocking them out like rabbits. Ultimately, that was, the, that was the secret of their success. Whatever other failings they had, and they were many, they kept on producing heirs. It's extraordinary that thrones were fought over left, right and centre, but yet <laughs> you could just inherit one. I oh, know. We don't... It's, you kinda, it's so easy to overlook what was actually going on. In the Europe, before the advent of parliamentary democracies, such as we have here in the British Isles, it's amazing to think that the countries of Europe, they weren't so much states for the longest time. They were landed estates. You know, a handful of families got control of all of the real estate and they fought with one another. They married and intermarried with one another. 
and they made decisions about the ownership of all of the land without so much as a buy your leave to the millions and millions of people actually living there. And nobody questioned it. It's quite incredible. You know, the kings and queens, they were having their little, their squabbles with one another, their internecine squabbles within and without their families. And they were setting the destinies and commanding the lives of millions of people. Uh, you tend to forget what monarchy actually meant. When they were making deals with one another, it was to extend their estates. You can look on the countries of Europe as great big landed estates. It's quite an incredible thing. But anyway, back to, to the British archipelago. Within a few hundred years, really, that fertility of the Stuarts, it spread their offspring through the country of Britain like fat through good beef. They were just everywhere. The family name Stuart, which ends in a T, T for tango, was actually a corruption of an old English word steward, ending in D for delta. And the steward was, in the world of a monarch, the staff running the day-to-day -day affairs of a king or a queen. The steward was the guardian of the hall. It was an honorary title, but they were notionally, and if you take it back to its oldest roots, they were responsible for bringing the meat into the banquet, seeing that the king and his retinue were provided with their meat. The Latin version of the same concept is dapifer, the bearer of the meat. And it's a nice metaphor, really, because when it came to the, when it came to the Stuarts, it was all about being able to deliver the goods. <laughs> you know, they could, they could, like nobody else, they could deliver, they could deliver the meat. My God, they could. And it all started in Britain with Walter Fitzalan. That was his actual surname, Fitzalan, which means the son of Alan, actually. And he was made steward with a D to King David the First in the middle of the 12th century, in the 1100s. After David, this same Walter Fitzalan was also steward for Malcolm IV and then William I, so he had a good run. And his descendants, having established themselves at the fireside, if you like, of the king, they stayed there, simmering nicely, always kept warm by their proximity to the ultimate power. King David II, who was Robert the Bruce's, offspring. He died childless in 1371 and he was succeeded by his uncle Robert the Steward. Now this Robert the Steward, still with a D, was the son of, this sounds quite complicated but bear with me, he was the son of Walter the Sixth High Steward of Scotland and Marjorie who was the daughter of Robert the Bruce. Okay, so Robert the Bruce had a daughter by his first wife, Isabella of Mar, and she was married into the line of the stewards. So from them came the progeny that were to be the stewards because they were descended from the high stewards of the kingdom. And so in that spectacularly convenient turn of events, when David II died childless, and was replaced by his uncle. His uncle was the Stuart. And from then on, the Stuarts were there. They had the throne of Scotland. And uh, like all the rest of them, Robert II was fertile and he had uh, oh, more children than anyone can usefully count. He had at least 10 legitimate from his f first wife, who was Elizabeth Muir. And that was just the 10 that lived into adulthood. By his second wife, Euphemia de Ross, he had four more. So if those legitimate children were not enough, and they were, you know, to secure the line of descent, he had uncounted bastards, uncounted illegitimate offspring with any number of women. And one of them, one of those mistresses was called Moira Leach, and she gave him one son who was born in 1399, and this was John Stuart. And he was later to be known as the Black Stuart because he had dark hair and a swarthy complexion. So he was the Black Stuart. Maybe it was some sort of reference to his mood as well. Who knows? Now, King Robert II, the king, 
It was his obligation to find lands and estates for his offspring. And when you've got as many offspring as he's got, legitimate or otherwise, it's it's difficult. You know, you've got to you've got to keep finding things you can give them uh, to keep them in the manner to which they'd like to become accustomed. But to John Stuart, the Black Stuart, the son of his one of his mistresses, Moira Leach, he gave a hereditary title, the Sheriff of Butte. And Butte is an island in the Firth of Clyde, which is the river that comes out of Glasgow or comes past Glasgow or through Glasgow. And as well as the island of Butte, the Black Stuart, John Stuart, received the islands of Arran and Cumbria. See, these are all, a lot of folk will have heard of Arran, you know, popular holiday destination. So too is Butte, or it was in the good old days, and and also Cumbria. And so from him are descended all of the individuals who ever since have held the title of Marquis of Butte. Marquis was a new title that was imported or created. But from that line, you get all the Marquises of Butte. And the seventh in the line of descent from the Black Stuart was James Stuart, who was made first baronet of Butte in 1627. You know, they're, they're creating and passing titles about like they're going out of fashion. And by this point, the name Stuart, which had been spelled S-T-E-W-A-R-T, there was a spelling change because during the lifetime of Mary, Queen of Scots, another Stuart, also fertile, did her duty producing offspring. They had changed the spelling of the name. Mary, Queen of Scots, was raised in France. Her childhood was was largely spent in France. And she didn't come back to Scotland until she was a grown-up. And the French had no W in their alphabet at that time. So to get around it, they made it U-A. So you get S-T-U-A-R-T. So that's why there are two spellings of Stuart. When I'm doing book signings, when someone says, you know, can you make that to Stuart? I've always got to check the spelling because you've got no way of knowing if it's going to be E-W in the old way or U-A in the more recent variation of the spelling. So in terms of the Stuarts, from that point on, it's S-T-U-A-R-T. Now, spell it however you like. The point is they are all connected to this superbly successfully fertile family. Actually, though, I mean, the the royal house of Stuart, eventually it did die out in the person of Henry. Henry Stuart, who was the brother of Charles Edward Stuart, the Bonnie Prince, Bonnie Prince Charlie of Culloden and all that. After the death of Bonnie Prince Charlie, it was his brother who carried on the line and he died in 1807. From that point on, the Stuart claim on the throne is effectively gone. After all their high days, after all their success, with the death of Henry, brother of Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1807, there's an end of it. But having said that, there are, of course, plenty of Stuarts around to this day. At the moment, still among us is the eighth largest landowner in the archipelago of the British Isles is Richard Scott, 10th Duke of Buccleuch. Okay, so the Duke of Buccleuch is a Stuart, or he's descended from the Stuart line. He's a descendant of James, Duke of Monmouth, and followers of the love letter to the British Isles will remember that the Duke of Monmouth was the eldest illegitimate son of King Charles II. He it was who raised the rebellion to try and take the throne which culminated in the Battle of Sedgemoor, which is in the back catalogue of the Love Letter to the British Isles. So you can see it, people, you know, no doubt people are getting confused with all the names, but the, just the point to remember is the extent to which the Stuarts are just everywhere. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to owning land and being, you know, and being in, you know, in or, or, or right next door to positions of power, the Stuarts were, were successful at that game, you know, par excellence. Were they clever as well? Canny? Well, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, they were. Although there were, you know, there were many fairly disastrous. There were there were many fairly disastrous Stuart kings, but it, it didn't matter in some respects because when one died, there were plenty more where that came from. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to be a Henry the Eighth or, or an Elizabeth the First. You know, very clever and, and successful and politically astute. But you fairly get overwhelmed by hordes and hordes of Stuarts if you can't produce children of your own. That's all that really matters. 
If you're going to be a successful lineage, you've just got to keep on knocking out the babies. Um, so there's, there's just Stuarts everywhere. Here we finally, finally after that long preamble, we get to Wales and Cardiff. Um, now before the Industrial Revolution, which we've also touched on in the love letter via Iron Bridge, before the Industrial Revolution, Cardiff was just another small town in South Wales. It was nothing. It was a port. And in the latter part of the 18th century, which is, you know, the late 1700s, there were just two ships really moving in and out of Cardiff port, taking care of all its trade. So it was nothing. It hardly counted in the scheme of things. But with the turn of the 19th century, once you get into the 1800s, once the Industrial Revolution caught fire, it spread like a wildfire. And it was based around the energy that was available from coal, because the Industrial Revolution was all about producing iron and steel. And you can't make either without coal. So whoever had coal was sitting on a black gold mine. Literally. Just nobody knew it at that point. It was just the luck of the draw. Now, in the Rhondda Valley in South Wales is Britain's richest source of coal. Very high quality coal at that. In many cases, you're talking about a classification of coal called anthracite, which burns very clean. It's fantastic. When you break anthracite, it, it looks like a gem. You know, it shines. And the Rhondda Valley was full of it. So, basically, and it, it took a surprising amount of time for this to get going, but gradually people began to realise that they were going to have to build canals and build roads and railways to keep the coal moving out of the Rhondda to where it was wanted. While all that was just starting to simmer before it came to the boil, one individual in particular saw the potential. Saw that Cardiff, there's little sleepy Cardiff in South Wales, close enough to the Rhondda and thereby the access point for ships coming in to fill up with coal. Now, enter John Crichton Stewart, second Marquess of Butte, who amongst other scattered land holdings, he had Cardiff Castle. One of his seats, as they say, was Cardiff Castle. And he had estates all over South Wales. And so he realised what had, by luck and by dynastic inheritance, what had landed in his lap. He had coal. And because of Cardiff, he had the place from which coal might be exported. Now, even at that point, people around him were very sceptical about what he started doing, which is to say he started developing Cardiff as a much bigger port. And he mortgaged possessions elsewhere and he took loans and he acquired money and he developed West Butte Dock in Cardiff. And it opened in 1839 and it started quite slowly, but inevitably, inexorably, it started to matter. More and more coal was being pushed out through Cardiff port and the money, the money started to pour in. Now, John Crichton Stewart died in 1848, but he, obviously he had a son. They've always got sons. And he was John the third Marquess of Butte. And he continued to develop the port. What his father had begun, he took to greater and greater heights. Another happy coincidence really fell into the laps in that the Admiralty, now that's who looks after the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy decreed the only coal from the Welsh Valleys was good enough quality for the steamships of the Royal Navy. So the corner of the market, the Admiralty, with all its warships and all its battleships all using coal, it will only take coal from the Welsh Valleys. And the best way to get coal out of the Welsh Valleys was through the Marquis of Butte's port at Cardiff. So it's, it's a license to print money. You now can't get coal out fast enough. The demand is astronomical. During the second half of the 19th century, the port at Cardiff became Britain's busiest and most important. It was even more important and busier than New York. Okay, so from 1850 onwards, in the second half of the 19th century, it mattered more for world trade than New York. 
Who remembers that? It's extraordinary. At its height in 1913, that was the big year. That was the big year for the Cardiff port. The volume of coal that it exported that went out through Cardiff would have been enough to fill the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff up to the roof 19 times. Imagine that football stadium that heaped up with coal 19 times over. Going out in 1913 alone, a lot of coal. Now, there was a coal exchange in Cardiff, of course there was. And it was in Mount Stewart Square in Butte Town, obviously Butte Town, Marcus of Butte. The context for the coal exchange was within a model housing estate that the second Marcus had built, amongst other things, as he was building up Cardiff. And it became the centre of the entire industry, the trade in coal. The Cardiff Coal Exchange opened in 1888 and it was where the price of coal was determined every day for the entire world. The whole world waited to find out what the trading price of coal was every day and the word on that came out of Cardiff. It's really quite amazing. In 1904, the world's first ever million pound deal was struck. First ever. And it was in the Cardiff Coal Exchange that the first million pound cheque was signed. Somebody wrote a cheque for a million pounds <laughs> and signed it in the Cardiff Coal Exchange. So in the story of the British Isles, you know, Cardiff, it burned bright. By God, it burned bright, burned white hot and exerted an extraordinary pull. It mattered so much to every corner of the globe. Everybody was waiting every day to get hold of coal to do all the things that you could do with that energy. And Butte Town was on the map, but that light burned bright for a relatively short space of time. Which is also interesting. It's also, it's also part of the interest. Jesse, be quiet. That's my dog. Did you hear my dog whining there? I did, yes. There was a very cosmopolitan community developed in Cardiff. People had come from all over the world to work. Ships, were, ships bring people from everywhere. And some people get off the ships and stay. And so in Cardiff, there developed this incredibly mixed, multi-ethnic community. There were at least 50 different nationalities represented in Cardiff. 50 nationalities. And it became known all over the world as Tiger Bay. Shirley Bassey, you know, the legend, the diva. I'm pretty sure she hails from Tiger Bay, okay? But Tiger Bay became world famous and no one really knows why it picked up that name. Apparently, at the entrance to the dock, tides make the water swirl. It's quite active. And especially in the low light of morning and evening when the sun's out, you can imagine a swirling pattern of light and dark moving ceaselessly on the surface of the water. And there's, there's a bit of a romantic idea that it possibly looked like the hide of a tiger. You know, that golden light with the black mixed through it. It made me even look like fighting tigers, whatever. It became known as Tiger Bay. Um, all of this was assured by and underwritten by and dependent upon global hunger for coal. And all the while the world wanted only coal, Cardiff just got rich and grew. But like everything else, the boom came to an end. However they start, like anything else, like oil, like tech, you know, there's a boom, there's a high point, and then something else starts to replace it. And really, after the First World War, the market for coal was flooded by cheap coal coming out of Germany. Lots of coal mines in Germany, the Ruhr Valley and all the rest of it, lots of coal. And that threw the price out, because there was now cheaper, decent coal available in Germany as compared to what was coming out of uh, the Welsh Valleys. And that was it. That was the beginning of the end. The glory days were over. Cardiff never had it so good again. And by the mid-1960s, Cardiff port had grown quiet. You might say the tigers were an endangered species and the coal exchange closed its doors for the last time in 1958. So that place wherein had been written the world's first million pound cheque, where the price of coal had been set every day for the entire world, it finally shut up shop in 1958. It is still there, repurposed as a luxury hotel. But, you know, time moves on. Of course it does. Things get left behind, but there is no denying how much Cardiff mattered. For those few bright decades, Cardiff, Tiger Bay, 50 nationalities, million pound deals, 
a black river flowing out of the Ronda through Cardiff out to the wider world. You know, Cardiff really mattered. And it's it's just good to know. It's just good to know. And the Cardiff Coal Exchange is worth going and catching a glimpse of. When you hear the phrase gold rush, you immediately understand it, don't you? Mm. But it's difficult to get your head around the vast wealth to be made from coal because it's associated with dirt and all that. There you go. What's the old saying? Where there's muck, there's brass. Uh, you know, um, it, but uh, absolutely, it's not glamorous. Coal is not, it, it ain't pretty, by and large. But the, that industrial revolution, and we're still in the aftershocks, we're still, we're still in a world that's affected by that industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution, all of that advance, the development of steam, the, the, the railways, all of that endeavour, architectural and in every other way in the Victorian era, it was all powered by coal. Britannia ruled the waves, and for a while she ruled them with the power of sail, but then it was coal. Steam-powered warships, battleships, that was how the British Empire was built, was with the power of coal. And if you had access to coal, it's like we looked at much earlier in the love letter, we talked about bronze, a world based on bronze, the ancient world of of the ancient Greeks and all the rest of it, they needed bronze for their weapons and for other things, which meant that instantly whoever had on their doorstep a source of copper or tin or both accidentally became incredibly influential, powerful and rich because the world came knocking on your door. And so the world came to Wales then to get the copper from Llandidno, the Great Orm copper mine, put Wales on the map then, it put Cornwall on the map because it was the richest source of tin. And so everyone in the ancient Mediterranean world had to come to Cornwall to get tin, had to go to Wales to get copper. So great wealth and influence followed. Well, when the world discovered that it needed coal to make, to build, to drive, who's got the coal? It's in the Rhonda, right? How can we get at it? Through Cardiff, it looks like. Who owns Cardiff? Second Marcus of Butte, here we go. Kerching. It's just more of the luck of the Stuarts, really. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. The largest man made object that has ever moved across the face of the earth. Nearly 900 feet long, the size of a modern skyscraper, 92 feet wide and weighing in at 50,000 tonnes. Built in Belfast, one of a set of near identical triplets, a time when technology was moving fast and machines were outstripping humankind's ability to keep them under control. A board ship for 2,200 passengers and crew heading out into the wild Atlantic Ocean sailing to tragedy as the band played on. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finances by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and who continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>